Okay, so um, for today's session, we are on session six of the Adaptation Planning and Practices course for Wildlife Management. So welcome back, everybody. We are very close to the end of the tunnel. Just a reminder, um, we will be recording this lecture and sharing it with the class um, after, after the fact. Um, go ahead and keep yourself muted unless you have a question or need to clarify something and then you're welcome to unmute and ask a question if you need to. You can also use the chat box at any time. And before we get into um, our agenda for today, um, I think Nikki and Katie are here. I'd like to introduce you to Nikki Van Hedeman and Kelly. Katie McGrath Novak um, from Colorado State University. Um, they have a great opportunity to tell you about. So Nikki, Katie, um, if you're out there, go for it. Hi, thank you. Yeah, it's just me today. Nikki's actually on a different class. Um, but yeah, thanks for letting us chime in just for a bit. Um, we just wanted to talk a little bit about a research project that we're working on. Um, so we are from Colorado State University and the Public Lands Policy Group, and the study we're working on is funded by the Forest Services Office of Sustainability and Climate, and we're looking at the impact of courses like this one um, that use the adaptation workbook, um, and we're trying to understand, um, one, how are the courses affecting climate adaptation planning and implementation of project level actions, so what are people taking from these courses and putting to action? Um, what barriers are people facing in implementing these actions? And then do these answers and challenges vary based on the region or by land ownership type? Um, so I wanted to put a face to my name and Nikki's uh, photo is there too. Um, after this course, we're gonna be reaching out to people who are working on forest and woodland ecosystem projects. Um, and we're hoping to get a couple of people to do 30 to 45 minute long virtual interviews with us um, to talk. So we'll do one right after, like within a couple of months to figure out, okay, what project are you thinking of? What did you learn from the course? Um, and then another one about a year later to see what you've done with what you learned from the class, um, any barriers you faced, et cetera. Um, so these will be completely voluntary, they're confidential, we won't share your individual answers with anyone who you work with or um, anyone from this course. Um, these are different from the post-workshop questionnaires, so you'll get a separate email from either Nikki or I that will be requesting the interview. The requests are usually a little bit formal, so um, I just want to put this on your radar and hopefully you all can kind of keep an eye out for those. And uh, we hope that you'll be willing to participate in our study. Awesome, thank you very much. Um, and uh, yeah, folks definitely give that some thoughts. We are always trying to figure out ways to use the experience that we have out there, folks who are doing this kind of um, adaptation and, and management um, and use that to show others, motivate others, illustrate for, for others um, what works and, and maybe what doesn't. Um, so thanks. So in session six today, we will be wrapping up the course, learning a little bit about climate change communication and how to tell your adaptation story and then we'll review um, homework and some reminders um, for the rest of this week and for our next session. But first, I wanna extend a big congratulations to everyone here. Making it to session six means that you have completed or mostly completed all five steps of the adaptation workbook. It's definitely a lot of work and we're excited that you've made it this far. So big pat on your back. Of course, you know, there's probably a lot of things you're still wrapping up, things that you wanna tweak or finalize, um, but Overall, you should be able to celebrate all of the work that you've done on your real world adaptation projects. 
Now, when the course began, we outlined the five steps of the adaptation workbook. But what you can really boil it down to is these two questions. How might climate change affect the resources that I manage? And what management actions can help prepare for those effects? At the beginning, before the course began, there were a lot of questions um, and many people were generally unsure where to start. So for example, what will climate change mean for me? What changes can I expect? How should I respond to climate change? And the answer to most of these questions is that it depends, right? There aren't simple questions here and there's no single answer that can be given because these variables are so complex. It comes back to the place on the land where we are and that the characteristics of that land, the history, the goals um, for that particular place and its inhabitants. This requires an understanding of your location, your management history and experiences and observations of the sites that you manage to help inform your thinking about actions that will help you in an uncertain future climate. We covered some introductory information and we helped coach you through these five steps, but ultimately the answers to these questions are designed by you. And now at the end of this course, we think you've got this. We hope that you feel better equipped to answer those questions, to connect the dots, to think about the, spe spe the specific effects of climate change to your project area and to identify adaptation actions that are relevant for your project. And we have a little bit of evidence for your progress. So as part of the homework, we asked you questions before you started the workbook. And then we asked you questions when you started step four. So one of these questions is the idea that you can identify viable climate change adaptation strategies that can be applied to your local area. So most people started off around a two or a three, um, although we did have one person that started off as a five and two people started off as a two. On average, it's, it's about a two or a three. And now after the course on average, you know, most folks are at a four or a five. So that's great. And it's a big jump in progress. The other question is whether you can translate broad adaptation strategies to actionable tactics in your, your local area. And again, we see a good increase here, signifying that the adaptation workbook has helped most people focus better on adaptation actions for their project area. So that's great. That's exactly what we wanted to see here. And now that you've all developed your climate adaptation plans, you can download and use this plan to reference anything in the future. So um, for example, informing your management plan, you can take these adaptation strategies and tactics and plug them right into an existing management plan, conservation easement or stewardship plan, or any other document that you might be working on. It also provides you with some of the science and research for climate change impacts and how that translates into your decisions behind actionable adaptation tactics. So this is a document you can print um, and share with, with colleagues or stakeholders um, if, if you find that useful. And just to remind you of the purpose of the course, we wanted you to be able to practice adaptation using the adaptation workbook process. So now that you have done that and you know how to use it and you will have these resources available to you even after the course, it's our um, hope that this decision-making process will be built right into your management from here on out. So as you think about all of the other things that you think about during the course of managing your land and resources, thinking about potential effects of climate change, 
challenges that those impacts create for you and then possible adaptation actions that minimize the effects of climate change and help you reach those goals. That will become second nature. Um, and, and maybe even someday you won't need to use the five steps of the adaptation workbook to, to log all of those separate thoughts. You can just naturally integrate that thinking into the, the good management that you do. You've also used your expertise and local knowledge to apply all of these tools to your, your local project area and you've documented your intentionality behind your thinking. So you can refer to this as you, you implement your management actions in the future. You can use this as a, a launching off point to, to tweak things that you worked on now to make them even better um, as you respond to, to new and interesting developments as we go forward. Part of this process is also creating a community of practice. Even though we're meeting virtually, you've had a chance to talk with others, working on similar projects or not so similar projects, but still somehow making connections, learning new things and helping us improve this tool um, for future users. So I just wanna say thank you all so much for joining this cohort of practitioners um, and thinking about climate change adaptation. So now you know you're not alone out there. We know that we have additional folks um, that we can work with to uh, integrate climate change into on the ground management. And so in terms of wrapping things up, we'll be talking about climate change communication today, and we'll be providing some instructions for finishing up your work in the adaptation workbook and sharing your adaptation story. And then we'll dive into our discussion session this week. So on Tuesday um, and also on Wednesday, we have discussion sessions. Um, and in those sessions, we will be focusing on monitoring and climate change communication and also answering any questions or um, issues you might have about identifying adaptation actions in step four. So I'm going to start off the climate change communication lecture today, and then I'll hand it over to Chris Hoving to talk about reaching and connecting with your audience. And so the fact is, Professionals are increasingly expected to integrate climate change into plans, documents, outreach materials, and management activities. Along with that, there is a strong need to both understand and communicate effectively to diverse audiences when it comes to climate change information. For example, you may be talking to the timber industry, a small woodlot owners association, or it could be wildlife biologists, tribal partners, um, or even the general public or youth. Um, each audience will have different questions that they're asking, different information needs, different concerns and values, and even different perceptions when it comes to climate change. And all of those are really important for understanding your audience and crafting a message that will reach them effectively. So the first place to start is to know your audience. And one really great resource is the Yale Program on Climate Change which has been collecting data on US beliefs, risk perceptions, policy support, um, and different behaviors around climate change. In their memorable 2018 report, they identified six audiences to classify all of their American respondents. And so these folks ranged from dismissive doubtful, disengaged, <laughs> to cautious, concerned, and alarmed, right? So most people, 59% um, 
of the, the survey respondents are alarmed and concerned. Um, and I believe at the time of this report, they had, um, yep, here it is, uh, 1,114 respondents. And so this is a small survey set, but it still gives us a little bit of insight um, into um, what folks are thinking. They also have res um, results in map form. So you can select a question and you can um, look at responses um, for an individual county, metro area, congressional district, um, or your whole state. And so um, these results are summarized for the whole nation here. Um, and just for simplicity sake, um, we can view them um, just in a, a bar chart. Um, so for example, um, we can see that most people believe that global warming is happening. So 72% of Americans believe that it is happening. 57% believe that it is caused by human activities. 55% think, most scientists think that global warming is happening. So who do we go for, to for our information? The scientists. Um, and 64% think that global warming is affecting the weather, right? As opposed to, you know, these, these dark blue categories, which are, you know, respectively a, a smaller proportion. Um, of respondents, but are still probably an important piece of, of information about your audience. Um, and so here we see that 63% of people are worried about global warming. 71% think that global warming will harm plants and animals. The same number that feel that um, global warming will harm future generations. Now here's where it gets interesting. 65% uh, of people believe that global warming will harm people in developing countries. 61% think it will harm people in the US. And 56% of people think that global warming is already harming people in the US, whoops. But interestingly, um, only 43% of people think that global warming will harm me personally. So they can see global warming is a threat, but maybe not a tangible one for them personally. And another thing that I think is interesting is that 71% of the US population think that climate change will harm plants and animals, you know, right? Which has implications for thinking about climate change and forest management. And yet only 55% of people believe that most scientists think that climate change is happening, right? So there's a gap in how we as scientists or natural resource managers or people in the know, it, there's, there's a, a gap in how we are communicating about climate change with our partners. Um, so you can access this data set. You can play around with different questions and you can even zoom in on your own county to explore the opinions of a proportion of your neighbors. Um, so having this insight could potentially help you craft your messaging and identify important gaps that need to be addressed in your audience. And it's too bad we can't zoom in even closer to look at people's responses by occupation. <laughs> For example, um, here we have some information about forester perceptions in Canada. So here, the majority of foresters believe that climate change is currently having a significant impact on forest ecosystems, and it will continue to do so over the next 50 and 100 years. And they believe that the forest practices currently implemented are generally not sufficient to face the impacts of climate change on forests. 
And the majority also believe that we need to create and design new forest practices to deal with the impacts of climate change on forests. So you can see that foresters are more concerned about climate change than the general population, which makes sense as these are people spending time in the woods, just like you and me, and they're able to observe change over time. So they are probably at the forefront of public outreach on local effects of climate change and, and how maybe it really is affecting them personally. Um, so just something to think about and how to, to really start to try to connect to your audience um, and who you might be able to lean on to help craft those messages. So next, I'll hand it off to Chris to present the next set of slides on reaching your audience. Okay, thank you, Patricia. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thanks. All right. Um, so yeah, reaching your audience. We've got, you know, Patricia just gave us a lot of good information on sort of learning about some of the, the demographics and some of the attitudes of your audience about climate change. But a lot of times, that's not going, that's important to know, but it's not going to be enough. To reach your audience, you need to know what they care about. Um, and often, I think if there's one thing that I want you to sort of take home from this, it's that people who are trained as scientists, like, like most of us, have an intuitive way that we try to communicate science to folks. And usually that works really well. Um, however, with climate change, it often will backfire. And so we need to sort of delve into communication science and how communication is done to make sure that we're not doing uh, our climate change communication the wrong way. So we'll dive into, so what, what do we mean about that? How do, you, how do you reach your audience? Why is it in particularly important with climate change that we do intentionally uh, craft our communication to reach our audience? So um, one of, next slide. So one of the, the key things that you need to know um, is not just about your audience's climate change you know, attitudes and what they know or what they think about climate change, but also what do they care about? Um, it, and this is something that you know, can vary a lot, even among people who are, say, outdoors people. You might have people who are very into recreation, for example. And you can say, okay, well, I need to craft my climate change communication around recreation. But what does recreation mean to to these people? Does it mean uh, mountain biking? Does it mean uh, whitewater rafting? Or, you know, even if they're into water sports, it could be fly fishing, which is very different. It may, you know, folks who are interested in fly fishing may have different values than those who are interested in whitewater rafting. But all of these things could have and do have intersections with climate change. So when you craft your communication, it's important to know uh, what folks' values are. And the best way to do that is through listening, um, trying to listen to what people are saying verbally, but also, you know, what they might be, what they might be wearing or, you know, who invited you, what their affiliations are, things like that. Listening is, is very important when you're trying to craft those audience, uh, reach a, a certain audience. Next slide. So uh, with wildlife species, um, often it uh, can be a good idea to uh, link to charismatic or iconic species for an area. Um, you know, Curlin's warbler for, North, uh, for Michigan, especially for Northern Michigan, is a species that people are, are often familiar with. And if they're not, when you tell them that, you know, Michigan is one of the only places uh, where this bird breeds and it's the, the core of their breeding habitat, for you know, one of the rarest warblers in the world, that, that can be a, a good hook for folks. Other times it can be about obscure species. You know, people might be really interested to learn about this new species, something they haven't heard about, um, you know, like the uh, a siren, for example, that we have this, you know, amphibian that lives in our soils that looks like a giant two foot long worm. Most people don't realize we even have those in, 
in Michigan. But, you know, saying that we have something like that can really, you know, pique people's interest. So it's important to think about what, what your audience is. If you're going to talk to uh, a group of Audubon Society uh, members in Northern Michigan, Kirtland's Warbler is probably a, a really safe bet. If you're talking to a bunch of, you know, kindergartners, something obscure and gross might be a really good way to sort of hook their interest. So think about your audience, think about where you're located in, in your community. Next slide. Also, when you're talking about climate change and trying to make this connection to, to values, it's important to focus on values that are self-transcending. And what I mean by that is values that uh, are widely shared and um, things that are something that um, a lot of people would uh, identify with rather than sort of taking uh, the rather than taking more of the, like the salesman approach where you try to figure out exactly what it is and then focus right in on that. Like you'll see more deer if we do a timber sale. People tend to see through that pretty easily. Whereas if you appeal to a broader set of shared values that can often be more, more engaging. Next slide. It is important uh, to make uh, local connections when you're talking about these things. A lot of people, and I, you saw this in the, the data that Patricia was providing, people often think about climate change and frame it as something that's happening far away and to things that are far, that are not like them. So people think of it as happening in to wildlife, especially to polar bears, something that's far away in developing countries. And as you get closer and closer to, you know, people's core identity, it becomes less, less relevant. And so it's important when you're communicating it to try to make that make that connection. You know, have you been seeing, you know, food prices increase lately? There's a lot of things going into that, but um, drought in several of the bread baskets in different parts of the world is part of the reason that we're we're having these high prices. Or have you noticed insurance rates going up? Well, insurance companies are paying more for all of these, you know, climate change disasters, and that spread among everyone who pays insurance. So we're all paying for, you know, when a, a hurricane hits someplace or a climate catastrophe happens someplace. Next slide. It's also important to, to be specific, and this can be a, a, a tough one um, when, you're, when you're communicating. It's a good one um, to keep in mind when you're, especially if you're preparing a presentation and you have some time to look up the specific statistics or predictions or model results for uh, a certain area, rather than saying there's been a significant increase in, in flooding or that we expect more flooding. You can say within the next 20 years, we expect to see a 10 to 20% increase in three inch rain events, which could result in you know, a certain percentage of soil loss. So that, that can be much more engaging because it really sounds much more specific um, and it shows that you've done your research. Next slide. Um, when using local events as, as examples, it's also important to understand the, that we are now getting to the point in certain areas where we can do attribution um, of, climb, of certain weather events or you know, short-term climate events in the, the near term and connect those to climate change but it varies with what, what types of things you're talking about. So extreme cold and extreme heat, there's been a lot of work on connecting those to, uh, to climate change. Um, extreme rainfall and droughts, it's a little more uncertain, but and when you get down to you know, a specific wildfire or uh, hurricane, um, there's a lot less certainty with those. So just understanding that we're not at the point anymore where you can say we can't attribute make connections between weather events and climate change. With some events, we're now getting to the point where we can start making those connections. So it is important to, you know, root climate change in those local examples of things that a community has, has experienced. Next slide. Um, if you've been in natural resources for any, uh, amount of time, 
you've probably realized that we never do natural resource interventions or natural resource actions for just one reason. There's always a host of reasons. We might call them co-benefits, we might call, call them ecosystem services, but usually when we do an action, it's because there are many different good reasons to do it. And the same is true of climate change. So it's good to couch climate change actions in terms of all of the things that they, they help with. So for example, a wetland restoration is good for lots of different reasons, but it helps us reduce risks from future threats such as heavy rain events and droughts and warmer temperatures. Next slide. Um, this is one that can be difficult to do, especially if you haven't uh, thought about it or done a, a little either introspection or, or research on it, but trying to engage across the political spectrum. It's relatively easy, easy to get uh, people on one side of the political spectrum riled up about climate change. Um, it can be difficult to engage other folks because a lot of the messaging that's been done hasn't been geared to uh, their, uh, their values or their uh, political ideologies. However, climate change is, it affects everyone equally, uh, whether it doesn't matter what their, their political ideas or biases are. Um, and so you can, especially if you're talking to an audience that is of a certain political um, worldview, you can focus on things like tradition, uh, energy security, national security is a very good one because the, the, there's a lot of folks within the national security uh, apparatus who have said a lot of great things about how climate change is one of the, one of the number one uh, defense risks for this, this country especially the, the Navy has been very clear about that. So by linking it to people's uh, values, similar to what I was talking about with linking it to you know, different recreation groups, you can think of that also with, with different political ideologies. However, it's important to make sure that you can speak to this authentically. Um, again, if you're trying to sort of give someone a, a sales pitch, that tends to be pretty transparent after a while. So if you can't do it, uh, in a genuine manner, it's probably best to try to find a, a, a different messenger. Next slide. And that gets to, to this slide. It's important to use uh, trusted messengers on climate change. And it's important to recognize when that's not you. Um, so if you're say, let's say you have, um, you're a, a person of, of Muslim descent and there's an opportunity where you need to go and speak to a, uh, a Catholic church. Depending on the church, that might be something where you can say, let's talk about our, our shared faith values. Or in another church setting, it might be very important that you work with someone from that faith or from that church to then deliver that, uh, that message. Um, this can be also you know, very true for, for outdoor recreation organizations. Um, some hook and bullet club or hook and bullet type um, recreation organizations, those that are really into hunting and fishing, might need to hear from someone who's very much into hunting and fishing um, and vice versa. You know, I, I probably wouldn't be the best person to reach out to, say, a birding group, for example, because that's not the, the recreation that I, I tend to do. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's important to pick trusted messengers. Also remember that certain groups are, are highly trusted. I remember seeing a, uh, a graph re not too long ago that said that firemen are the most trusted group. So if you can find a fireman to talk about climate change, you know, that's, gonna, that's gonna be our most trusted. However, they found that natural resource professionals were just below them and then healthcare professionals, then scientists. So we are part of a pretty, we have a lot of trust uh, with society, probably more uh, trust than we, we realize. It's also important to recognize there are certain groups that are less trusted. Um, I think last time I checked the um, approval rating for Congress at the federal level was something like 9%. Um, so 91% of people don't trust uh, that particular audience. So you want to 
be careful not to rely too heavily on uh, groups like, in general, politicians, the media, um, groups like that. Um, lawyers probably would be a, another one that used car salesmen. You know, the, those groups that have a, a lower level of, of trust for one reason or another, uh, whether it's deserved or not, are probably ones to, to veer away from. Unless, you know, you, your group is politicians of a certain stripe, it may be good to have a politician that they trust come in and give the talk. So there's, there's exceptions to every rule. Next slide. This is another one, um, and the, this is one where the climate change, I, I sort of alluded to the climate change science or the climate change communication science is, is really important. Um, gloom and doom um, is not just a ineffective way to communicate climate change. It is a very counterproductive way of communicating climate change. And I tell people again and again within the DNR and whenever I can, if you're going to give a talk that's gloom and doom about climate change, I would rather you didn't give it. Um, it would be better that you gave no talk at all rather than um, focusing on the, the doom and gloom aspect of it. Really focusing on the, the I can do it, we can do it, um, that it's something where there is a, uh, an action that we can take that's going to make the future better is the way to focus on, on climate change. Um, and it's not just, you know, feel good, uh, you know, not, I'm not just saying that because it's a, a trendy thing. There's a lot of sociology behind, uh, behind this, this slide here, a lot of science. Um, if we focus on positive and productive messaging, um, it has a lot better chance of people just hearing what you're saying about climate change, much less them actually taking um, action in the future. Next slide. So here's an, an example of, you know, communicating climate change from an I can do it sort of frame. You can say intense precipitation events are increasing, but then pairing that with, so it makes sense to invest in water control structures that will help manage water levels. It shows that climate change, because a lot of people have in their, the frame that they're coming at climate change from is this sort of apocalyptic event that there's nothing we can do about it. And we, when we can show there are things that can be done that have a, a real impact, um, it has a, it changes people's frame and it helps them to start moving from inaction to action. Next slide. It's also important, and we talked about this a, a little, little bit before, it's important to highlight the co-benefits of, of good management. Um, in natural resources, we never do anything for just one reason. And uh, people who uh, might not care that much about climate change or even maybe resistant to climate change messaging, if you frame it in other things that they care about, they're more likely to accept, uh, accept what you're saying. And even if they don't accept what they're saying, they're more likely to support the, the action that you're, uh, that you're talking about, um, which is about as good as you can, you can expect. So, you know, managing for long-term benefits, maintaining ecosystem functioning, managing for a range of future conditions. These are all things that are co-benefits, other things that are, will happen because of the, the work that, uh, the climate adaptation work that you're talking about. Next slide. So telling your adaptation story. So how do we, you know, I gave you lots, lots of advice. How do we actually do this? How do we, how do we incorporate this? Um, it's important to sort of start with laying the groundwork um, to tell your adaptation story effectively. Um, it can, th there are a lot of benefits to uh, telling your adaptation story um, beyond just supporting, supporting what you're doing. So it can help you gather support, institutional or, or financial support. It can help you reach a larger audience and it can help communicate key lessons. Um, adaptation is a very young field. A lot of what we're doing is pretty new. And so it's gonna be important to communicate what's working and what's not so that we can adapt fast into the future. Next slide. So what makes a, what makes a good story? Um, there are a couple 
key things to remember when you're telling your adaptation story. One is to tailor the message to your audience. So it's, this is something I've, I've told you twice. I think this is the third time, uh, very important. Knowing what the values are of your audience is absolutely key as you start to tailor your, tailor your message because you need, if, you're, if people are gonna pay attention to you, they need to know that we're talking about a shared set of values. You need to follow a logical sequence of ideas and connect the dots as you go through what you're communicating so that people understand the logic of it. Climate adaptation is probably a relatively new idea for most people in the audience. So it's important to sort of walk them through it. Um, you need to be clear about the importance of intentionality, that this isn't something that is just going to passively happen, that society is going to adapt to climate change. It's going to require that we, uh, we take action with intention. You need to include specific details so that people have something to, to focus on um, and, and you know, ground it in reality. And, but you also need to connect those specific details, that specific action to the bigger picture, to a larger set of values, to a larger, larger movement, because that's what motivates people to act. Next slide. So um, once you've got that, that information and you're sort of pulling it together, it's also important to craft what you're talking about into a, a narrative. Um, people tend to think in narratives and especially they remember things in narratives. So if something is in a story format, people enjoy hearing it more and they're much more likely to remember it. Um, and there, there are a couple, I've got two frameworks here that help understand what, what a narrative is or what, what we're talking about when we talk about a narrative. Um, the first one, the most simple one is and but therefore. Just about every compelling narrative or story has these three elements. Um, there's the and part of it. So you're sort of laying the basis for it. Um, you know, in a good joke, this is sort of setting up the, the punchline. And then there's a but. There's something that turns and creates tension in, in the story. Um, something that is unexpected. And then there's the therefore. What happens because of, of that change? Um, a lot of science communication tends to be and, 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 where we just give people information, but we never give them like why it's important or make it a, you know, what, what's the tension in the, in the story. Um, the other type that you'll see, especially from academics um, or people like myself who just naturally tend to talk this way is the despite however yet, where we're just keep including every one of those those tension things. It's this way, except in this way, but if this, however, um, that tends to be very confusing and people tend to have a hard time following what the story is because it's so complex. Another way of organizing a story, which is a, just a little variation on this and but therefore is the narrative archetype, um, the hero story journey. So every most stories follow this in some way, shape, or form. They usually put little tweaks on it, but it starts in a familiar wor world where something about the world is familiar, and then somehow the, the hero journeys into a world that's unfamiliar, or they're thrown into an unfamiliar situation. There are a bunch of challenges that have to be overcome, and then after those challenges are overcome, they return to the familiar world transformed. And so what in the world does this have to do with, with climate change? Next slide. So here's a, an example story. Um, we start with a place and a purpose. Um, it could be a, uh, a project that you're, you're working on. It has certain goals, certain objectives. It's grounded in a, a, a certain place. And then you incorporate these key risks from climate change. Um, you know, climate change is going to be affecting that place and those purposes and maybe making it harder to get to them. And then you develop these adaptation actions to address key risks. So you overcome these challenges. And then there's a set of outcomes and benefits, which are really told in the same, you know, they're, they're the, about the place and the purpose, but you've incorporated them. This is the and, but therefore, the and is the place and the purpose. The but is climate change. It's the, the risks from climate change. And then the therefore is what we've done about it. Next animation. This is also the hero's journey. 
place and purpose, your original plan that you started with was familiar. Climate change, this is unfamiliar. This is a change, the different adaptation actions and risks. These are, these are the challenges. These are what we overcame. And then transformed is the outcomes and benefits. It's that place and purpose, but it's now in a better place and a better purpose with less risk because we went through that journey. So this feels familiar. It's because you've already made the hero's journey through the, the workbook. We've sort of guided you through a hero's journey and you've, you've, you've done it now. Um, so you've got all of the pieces to, to pull together your story, whether you're using and but therefore or the hero's journey, it's all there. Next slide. And with this, I'm gonna bounce it back over to Patricia to talk about the, the specifics. Okay, great. Thanks so much, Chris. Um, so this, I think, is a very exciting part of today's lecture. This is where we get to talk about your presentations next week. So this is your opportunity to share your story. And Chris just gave you some great tips on how to do that. So um, we will not have lecture next week, but during each of our discussion sections, we will be signing up to each give a five minute presentation on your adaptation workbook experience. So you will have five minutes. Please practice this. We don't um, usually have a lot of time to let you go over on. Um, we also want to include um, some time for your classmates to ask questions or for your instructors to ask questions. Um, and this is really just a chance for us to provide you some positive feedback um, or just appreciate the, the story that you have told as your last assignment. OK, so we'll provide a template for you. Um, we'll give you one minute per slide. And we are asking you to condense your whole complex, awesome project into some really neat, effective communication bullet points, OK? So we want you to focus on telling a story about what you're trying to do how climate change will impact that, how you will respond to climate change, and how you will track um, your progress toward your goals and objectives, okay? So we want that, that um, quick summary um, and not every detail of your workbook. We just don't have time to look at all of your objectives and all of your impacts and all of your adaptation actions. And so this is your opportunity to provide us a quick synopsis of the most exciting parts of your adaptation project. Okay, so we are going to provide you um, with a template. We'll provide you with a link to this template in the newsletter that I, I should be able to send out tonight, um, if not early tomorrow. So you'll have um, five slides in this template and you feel free to customize these slides as you see fit, okay? So these templates are really just to help you get started um, and to really just help you identify the information that we really wanna see in these presentations. And so um, here's your template for slide one, um, you know, replace that with your project title. We want you to identify your project, your place and your purpose. So maybe some really broad goals um, or your vision for this project. And we also want you to identify the audience to which you are telling this story, okay? So is it your office that you're reporting back to? Is it your stakeholders? Is it public that is asking questions? Um, is it literally only the people in this class because, you know, you, you have no one else to share it with? That's fine. We just want you to identify who that audience is. Um, and then 
think about that audience and think about the words that you're using to describe what makes this project area special. Okay, so that it resonates with your audience and also um, share your major management goals that that relate to your story. And we've included a couple places where you can insert pictures or maps to help tell that story. Okay, so it, it can be one picture or one map. You could replace this with six different pictures, right? You can make the whole slide a background picture. Just get really creative. Um, try to address the elements on each of these slides, but then, you know, change the font, make it pretty, make it wow, you know, whatever you need to do. So our next slide is about climate change impacts and challenges and opportunities. And so here we just want you to describe your top two to four impacts or challenges. Again, the ones that are important to telling this quick story about what is what you need to do and why you need to act, right? So how does climate change make it harder, harder or easier for you to achieve your management goals and objectives? Okay, so summarize your ideas from your adaptation workbook. It's already all there. So if you want to print your adaptation plan, um, you can copy and paste some of those ideas directly from your plan into these slide templates. Um, and again, you can add a, a picture here if you would like to do that. Um, next, we have a slide about your adaptation actions. So this is where you want to tell us what adaptation actions will help you address those, those most significant climate change impacts or challenges. Um, and then this is also an opportunity for you to tell us if these ideas are um, kind of business as usual, or if they're different enough from what you normally do that they're going to require some buy-in from somebody or some extra resources, cash flow or um, uh, manpower or equipment. Um, so, you know, let us know what you need to implement um, this action. And if you have solutions um, to that, uh, that's great if you can find, um, find your own solutions to those needs as well. And then finally, outcomes. So what are those key outcomes that you hope to achieve through this project? Um, and this kind of relates to the monitoring piece where you have identified what you're going to track in order to tell us whether you are successful or not, or something that you need to keep your eye on so that um, you, know, you can make sure that you are on a good pathway toward meeting your management goals and objectives. So this should be a fun final assignment. We want you to really um, take these templates and make them your own and come to discussion session uh, next week, ready to give that five minute synopsis um, and, and let us hear all the good work that you have done. Um, and again, it's, it's good to practice uh, what you're going to say so that you can hit that five minute mark without um, going too much over. So um, also in the newsletter, we'll be providing a link to the page that you need to go to to sign up for your presentation time period. Okay, so there are three discussion sessions. You've probably been going to the same time slot all throughout the course. There, there's one Tuesday morning, there's another one Wednesday morning, and then there's a third one on Wednesday afternoon. Um, if you are in a discussion session and that time still works for you next week, please sign up for any of the slots in that session. If you need to move to a different session because of a conflict um, or any other reason, um, just give us a heads up um, so that we can make sure that there are enough um, slots for everybody. But we should be able to accommodate um, if you need to choose a different session. But we need you to go in regardless of whether you're staying in the same place or not. Just go in, write your name down, um, 
and let us know, you know, number one is going to go first. So if you don't want to be number one, maybe you should get in there and, and choose number nine, right? <laughs> so um, make sure that you look for this link in our follow up email, we would like um, like to, to get those assignments as early as possible so that we can plan accordingly um, and be there to, to host and time you um, to make sure that everybody gets a, a chance to present. So um, finally, so for your assignments for, for this week, we want you to sign up for your presentation by April 13th. We want you to start working on your presentation using that template. You can either return the presentation to Stephen by the 19th, or you can um, put it in the Google Drive, okay? So we'll provide a link to that as well. We also want you to finish your adaptation workbook. So go back to any steps that you need to tweak or add to or finalize. Remember to do your homework at the end of, of, um, uh, of the, the course um, and complete that by next Tuesday as well. Um, and then for optional reading, we have a couple of communication resources for you. Um, so links to those are in your syllabus and um, we'll also put those in the, the email that's going out. And as one last bonus assignment, which is completely and totally optional, we want you to share your project as an adaptation demonstration on our foristadaptation.org website. So we showed you that map in the beginning, all of those different dots um, that, that represent a landowner who has gone through the adaptation workbook using a real project in a real place and has identified what those climate change impacts are and what are those strategies that they can implement to deal with um, their unique situation. Every story that we have on that website is inspiration, um, motivation, and education for other landowners who are maybe tackling climate change for the first time ever and have no idea what it looks like. And so these are really valuable stories that we can add to this library of examples that might resonate with someone either locally or topically. Um, so there's a couple ways to, to get your story online. It's not that different from the work that you're putting into these five minute presentations anyway. Um, there's a template that we can um, send you um, that allow you to kind of summarize your project um, by each of those five steps. Or um, if, if you're just needing a break and you can't tackle that at the moment, you can ask Stephen or I or um, someone else to take the first stab at writing that up for you. Um, and again, pictures are always nice. So just a reminder, uh, we do have discussion sessions this week. So please be prepared to discuss your adaptation tactics and, and your monitoring ideas. Um, and work on those presentations. So those presentations will happen on the 19th and 20th. Um, and we need you to sign up for um, one of those sessions. Although you are welcome to attend all three sessions if you are able. Um, so with that, I think we're at time. Thank you all for um, being with us throughout this course, and especially this last session on climate change communication. We'll stick around if anybody has any questions. Um, otherwise, you are free to go. And we are very much looking forward to hearing your presentations next week.